Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we are rejoined by Charlie Spears of Naka Motor. We're talking about Celsius mining, what the fallout from ASIC liquidations from their mining operation might entail, and then also about the heat that a lot of miners across the United States are experiencing. We're seeing temperatures between 90 degrees all the way up to 100, 105 in many places in the U.S. where mining is prevalent. That is bad news for mining. Before we dive into that, we'll have a quick shout out to our new sponsor, Foundry Digital. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Charlie, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. I dig your spot. I got to get this spot similar. This is the new Compass Media office here in Denver. We'll have you here pretty soon for an in-house podcast, but yeah, I I'll buy her to your level of podcasting room. <laughs> well, hey, look, you know, COVID happened and, and my wife and I gave ourselves uh, a very generous budget to uh, build anything related to video conferencing and video gaming because we want to be well-rounded individuals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. While well, you're doing it. I mean, you got the Asics, you got the purple mic. It's pretty nice. Yeah. And this time, yeah, I think last podcast I was on, these two S9, technically, I don't know if they work or not. They don't have PSUs. But this, uh, yeah, this What's My Name 32 does work. I was actually kind of running some tests on it here. Um, but it's hard to do because this is a large apartment and I don't want to piss off my neighbors too much. Oh, um, it's an apartment. Yeah. Well, someone made like an apartment mining guide sometime like six months nine months ago I don't know i've seen a that. few yeah there's there's been some really good ones um i really gotta shout out the people who have innovative you know you think you've seen it all you think you've seen every conceivable home setup mm -hmm. and then somebody comes along and they're like this is actually half the cost twice as good yeah and it won't uh set your house on fire and yeah um yeah right now everybody's in the immersion setup i'm i'm a huge fan of the uh, really well done DIY immersion setup for home mines. I have two S19s and there's a a chip error people are starting to realize is a problem with them uh, that there's like a missing piece of solder as I understand it. And this is actually sort of alpha for people out there mm -hmm. on this internally at Compass. And at some point we'll, we'll write it up after we do some experimentation on it. But there's like a piece of missing solder on one of the temp sensors and it flips the switch triggers a fan error and then turns off your S19 before it's even like in the position to be like overheated. And two of my S19s have that problem. And so I haven't been able to run my home mine since early May, even though like it's been like 65, 70 degrees outside, I can't run the mine because this chip error. So I'm going to fix that soon and then maybe transition to like a small immersion setup is what yeah. I want to build next. And then I hopefully can put like brains on them and start recouping some costs because I've basically had them for six months and they've only run for one of those months. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a yeah. sunk investment at this point. <laughs> my only kind of my cursory knowledge of, of immersion actually makes me say it probably makes it almost smarter to try to do immersion at home because, mm -hmm. um, you can get the, you can get the cool, you get the fluid, um, pretty quickly. And now it's a, the cost has dropped way down from two years ago. Yeah. But really, it's a lot of the, the dry coolers that at scale, just almost impossible to acquire. And that's, of course, probably we can talk about infrastructure and the, the yeah, I guess. But for the home setup, you know, you can kind of jerry rig or custom build these smaller coolers, mm -hmm. which actually work on the one or two to five S19 scale. And so that's yeah. where I see a lot of really cool innovation happening. And you can follow some of the cool Twitter accounts who talk about it and catalog it and yeah. go in those um, Telegram groups and uh, see what people are building. Yeah. No, it's pretty cool. We have a new warehouse here in Denver. It's going to be like a logistics hub and a testing bench for us. And I'm hoping to use that service center for building some of these things and then making some video content out of it. Because we have like some good video content on our YouTube, but it's not as in the weeds as I'd like it to be. 
Mm-hmm. So we're going to try to, to do some of that, but let's get to some mining news. Cause there's, there's a lot to cover and we only have about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, the biggest thing I think is Celsius. So this is, this is huge in a lot of different ways. Obviously, Celsius filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy yesterday, but they had a significant mining arm that invested $500 million into mining last year, 2021. And then this year, they did even more investments. I don't know how the total dollar figure, but again, in 2021, $500 million. They have equity stakes in Core Scientific, um, Luxor, and one other rhodium. And then they also have loans out to core scientific and Argo for expanding facilities. So like a huge player in the mining game as a loaning operator. And then also just for equity deals is now in chapter 11. Um, all those mining firms will likely be fine. Like there's always clauses in the contracts to get yourself out of that or unwind the whole deal. But it's just significant to see such a large player explode. Uh, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it before we dive more into like the mining side of things. Cause they also have a significant mining arm that's going to start liquidating. It's actually started liquidating a lot of its ASICs. Yeah. I mean, you thought there was a supply glut uh, a couple months ago. Uh, hold on to your hats because, um, you know, I, I talked to people and you know, what Marathon expected 135,000 S19s plugged in this summer. If, and that's, you know, yeah. their plans for a year ago. And they're what, 35,000 in the hundred, the other hundred thousand are sitting in warehouses in like Houston or something, you know? So, yeah. and that was already going to be that type of event was already creating this supply glut on the sell side, but also just depressing anticipated hash rate growth, you know? add the Celsius onto that. It's interesting because, you know, each cycle, there's there's different kind of mechanisms and personalities to the specific way miners capitulate. And, um, and previously, it's kind of been just more real economic terms. And now it's almost like exogenous market factors of it's, these are these are collateralized or um, because of finance, you know, more financial instruments coming to play. And uh, that's kind of what's, I think that's going to really, we're going to be able to see this happen in real time, how it may make sense to plug an S19 onto eight cent power, but it doesn't make sense to have financed that S19 uh, in a really aggressive way. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of unwinding here. And that's what responsible miners who have been in this industry for a while, I've already been talking about. Same time, I think it always catches people off guard how it actually occurs Celsius is huge, like huge billions yeah. of dollars under management, and it's completely being vaporized in front of everyone's eyes. And you know, eighty thousand ASICs is a lot of ASICs. You mentioned Marathon, right? They're trying to get one hundred ninety nine thousand online by early Q three, Q one of twenty twenty three. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have a lot online r- online right now, but like there's a lot of ASICs that are just sitting around. Like these, all these machines have been built, right? They've been built by Bitmain, What's Miner, MicroBT, and others. They're just sitting there, and they're not adding to the hash rate of the network. They're not doing anything. They're likely going to be sold, and we already saw a little bit of that this morning. Actually, recording on Thursday the 14th this morning, CleanSpark announced that they purchased about a thousand miners uh, that were already operating from um, a firm up in New York. So like we're already seeing these distress contracts go live, but they're going to get even worse, right? Because now we have just like thousands of basics that are able to be, uh, to be purchased in bulk question back to you. What do you think about like facility and rack space right now? Uh, Because that seems to be just as tight as ever, even though we see ASICs going on fire sales, like people are going to buy these ASICs for fire sales, but they're still going to want to plug them in somewhere. Yeah, I wonder if we see a bit of a second shock here because um, anybody in the right minds n- knows that this is a great time to buy ASICs. But what happens if they buy them and then because rack space is so difficult to achieve, they can't they can't even the second buyer of that ASIC can't plug it in on their timeline. Um, or what if they're forced to sign again, um, just challenging uh, unstable energy deals. So these are the questions we're going to look for. I don't have an answer, but I think we could see kind of a, a second shock. Who buys all these uh, S19s that are being liquidated and then can they plug them in? Yeah, I don't I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I know <laughs> that some of these uh, 
these A6 from Celsius were already purchased at auction for really cheap. Um, I saw some like emails and stuff floated my way that, that showed like really low prices um, when these ASICs were sold. But even still, like there's infrastructure as well that needs to be sold. So looking at documents, yeah. uh, there's about $720 million worth of mining assets on Celsius's books. And that would include a 102 megawatt deal with Moss and Energy Group. Uh, or infrastructure group rather down in Texas. And so how does that deal uh, unwind as well? I don't know the specifics of the deal. My, my slight understanding is it's like a, a host plug and play sort of deal where they ha- helped pay for the infrastructure and then they're going to be able to put their units on a rack there. But for Mawson, like you're looking at this, you're seeing like one of your biggest partners on a very large site just liquidate. Mawson obviously has a lot more megawatts in their capacity in other places, but 102 megawatts is a lot. Like if you do the math on it, right? Like you can get a megawatt of site development for between a hundred thousand all the way up to say $500,000, depending on your all in cost, whether it be like energy, hash huts, labor, connecting to the grid, all that stuff. I mean, that's a ton of money that Mawson is having to deal with and figure out what they're going to do with this. And, and hopefully the contracts are lined up that they can just swoop in, pick all this up and are okay. And like, those assets, obviously, they still have a dollar price. They're still there. It's just in Chapter 11. So it's going to be like some arbitration over the, the next few yeah. years or months. Hopefully not years. But it, it's curi- I'm curious to see how this all unwinds because it's going to definitely have a play not on only ASIC prices, but also infrastructure going forward. Yeah, I agree. I, I like to say um, a hash in the hand is worth two in the warehouse. Um, what That's does nice. it matter if you have a hundred thousand S19s if they're not on? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even just think about it from the 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 contagion across the entire lending space, right? You have the public companies and you have the the super majors, but then you have a lot of these kind of little guys, like honestly, like me, who you've got a you've got a few megawatts, right? And um, a lot of these people have used have uh, taken loans to finance these. So again, yeah. this may not have as much contagion at the at, at scale, but a lot of the pain is going to be felt by some of these these guys who've you know they really kind of they they really bought the farm or sold the farm whatever they bet the farm. <laughs> <laughs> some of the farm. <laughs> yeah, they, they bet the farm on this, and um, now Bitcoin is below its previous 2017 all time high. Um, a lot of people thought that was infeasible. I certainly didn't expect it. Regardless, like um, a lot of a lot of those could be liquidating. Um, I will say on the on the other side, it, it, we will see some infrastructure change hands, maybe on a smaller scale. So switch gears, power supplies, conduit, yeah. these things. Um, this is where your kind of internal minor deal groups really shine, because you cannot go purchase most of this equipment anywhere. And you're only going to see these liquidations kind of in these more private closed circuit groups. And so that's why um, a lot of these, like these, uh, these smaller groups, which maybe have, have a telegram channel or something, which have really been building trust and community on that network. They're going to shine because I can now go buy that guy's panels and uh, maybe not lose my shirt on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's definitely going to get easier for the little guy right now. If you like held on to some money and you're able to scoop up some ASICs, hopefully find some cheap hosting somewhere, it could definitely be some good options for the little guy to get in. Because like a lot of people are priced out, right? $10,000 ASIC. And that's what we were used to for quite a while there. That was normalized in a lot of ways. But if you look at the MSRP of these ASICs when they came out, you know, it was 1500 to 2500 depending on what sort of model you had. And obviously got a little higher depending on the efficiency and what type of model and where you're purchasing and all that stuff. But you know, that's a yeah, 5X well, gain in some cases or 10X gain. Yeah, and think about it. If you're a little guy and um, you, it's really, there's a big threshold between raising like $1 million and like $10 million. Um, a lot of people can finance a modest mining operation for under seven figures with just passing the hat around friends and family. I'm bullish on those deals and people who are kind of priced out of building more than a couple megawatts. So now those people can get pretty close to that. And um, yeah, I think we'll see a new generation of American miners because, you know, all these people were, have been priced out since China came. Everybody wants to get in. Nobody could actually pull together the capital. So very bullish on the small guys. 
I'm agnostic and kind of across the board on the bigger guys because um, yeah. who a lot of it's just very path dependent. We'll see um, a lot of acquisitions yeah. and stuff. Yeah, we're definitely going to see some acquisitions. My, I, I, I'm looking forward to, and not like in a positive sense, really. I'm just curious what's going to happen with some of these public mining firms that have taken out a lot of debt financing because it's expensive, right? The interest rates we're talking about are 12% plus. And uh, we did a nice podcast with Galaxy Digital's lending and mining team two weeks ago. And they're talking one of my favorite about- podcasts, by the way. I learned way more in that than I would You're so smart. Yeah. 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 We're going to have Cassie and Craig back on again and get Amanda on here as well. Um, just so much knowledge on that team and the 12% or higher interest rates. That's unsustainable for a lot of mining teams unless you have some sort of backing or you're actually getting, you have enough hash rate online to support that. Um, so I, I do know from public disclosures that teams like Argo Blockchain and BitFarms, they both have very high interest rates on outstanding debt. And that interest rate payment is eating into their cost of production uh, or eating into their monthly revenues uh, quite a bit. And that hurts right now because a lot of these teams are trying to finish off sites uh, or they're in the process of deploying entire new sites. So Argo Blockchain has a Helio site down in Texas. They've had a lot of problems with it. I think a lot of people in Texas have had problems with sites though, uh, to be fair, like a lot more than people consider. That's why we're bullish on Oklahoma mining, right? Uh, but then Bid Farms as well. Uh, their, their site, to my knowledge, has actually been like pretty smooth. Um, but still, you have that debt from debt purchased when ASICs were high, so meaning you got less ASICs with the debt that you took out, and you still have a high interest rate. And then now you could do the same debt financing. You'd probably have a higher interest rate, but you'd likely get more assets for whatever you purchased. So it's it sucks to see that how like the macro conditions change and like your entire financing structure will look completely different just six months later. But that is the game of the market, right? You you uh, either play and lose or you, you know, play and you win. In this case, it seems like a lot of these people are going to have to do some sort of restructuring and figure out what they're going to do. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because this is going to be the second bear market that some of these big guys have experienced and the first that some of the others have experienced. And so I look at somebody like HUD-8 who, um, you know, performs pretty well across most metrics, not all, but this ain't their first rodeo. Like they've, um, they've, 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 uh, they came out successful and strong out through a downturn and, um, you know, I look at say core scientific, right? So they're, they got a lot of money tied up in Celsius, a lot of financing. They're pretty, they're saddled with debt, but they've also been around the block a bunch. So, um, I, you know, I've personally, I've remained, uh, kind of, out, uh, I've kept my hands off the, the traditional equities markets, but for those people who are looking at um, how to bet on the public minor stocks. This is one of the more interesting opportunities. And we're going we're to see some people make some really good bets on the public ownership of these companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely wanted to pay attention more to public miners now that we've seen a lot of the, the bleeding seem to have stopped. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk about shit coins, I mean, a lot of these <laughs> public mining companies just felt like a rock, right? Like Holy, talking, it's, you're talking about reflective ADS. assets. Yeah. Yeah. Shopify yeah. was down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not saying anything about the teams, not saying anything about their models. Uh, I know a lot of people at these companies, awesome models, awesome teams, awesome products, but the public markets don't seem to care, right? They're saying, eh, I'm done with this toy, I'm going to drop it. And that's why we saw like 80, 90% down in some cases. I haven't looked at them in the last yeah, week we, or so. We even we saw some, we even saw some yeah, we even saw some like periods and I don't, Again, I don't look at this that closely, but where the like the val the market cap fell below like their real value of assets. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was ridiculous. Like to me, if I had been paying more attention and more active approach to that kind of investing or trading, I would be like, oh yeah, totally going to go up. I just wonder if the market, if for some of these companies, has just been way too reflexive. Um, yeah. Because you can look at their public disclosures and say the stuff on the balance sheet is lower than the market and is pricing yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's it's absolutely brutal. 
absolutely brutal. Uh, but that's the name of the game. M and a stuff. Let's talk about that really quick. Yeah. What, what do you think it looks like? So the last time I had a conversation with this, uh, about this topic was with block metrics. They were a newer mining company. This was back in March. They raised about $50 million and their game plan was to, to figure out the first steps of mining. They were mining noobs and they admitted it freely, which was cool of them just to be like, Hey, we're here to learn, but we're also here to grow. They raised $50 million uh, just because of their capital backgrounds they are able to, to utilize that to earn money uh, or raise money rather. And they had a small hosting deployment. Uh, but my understanding was they were planning on rolling up a lot of these mid-sized firms saying like between a thousand and 5,000 ASICs and start picking them up during a bear market. Is that where you're sort of expecting is like these mid-sized players start coming under these bigger players, like the core scientifics of the world start picking people up or is this going to be completely different and we just see total bloodbath and it's going to take a year or two to figure out what actually happened? Well, you know me, I'm, I'm a public optimist <laughs> quickly trying to meter that with some more realism, but, um, yeah, I, I really don't have a lot of insight to the, the private side. If those, mm-hmm. those deals which are happening, we won't see how they play out for, for months. I think the public miners are a little bit more interesting because, you know, you have, if Alameda or Sam Bankman fried saying, yeah. Oh, I want to buy miners and he's just, he's going to buy the whole world. And yeah. You know, and, uh, I can only hope that he's effective and altruistic about it as he, yeah. as he purports to be. So for the mid size, smaller size, I think we could see that certainly there's some capital out there who hasn't lost desire to own Bitcoin miners and, they're going to deploy capital really well right now. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it comes down to, and we see this, we saw we saw a Cambrian explosion of everybody and their dog wanting to build a Bitcoin mine stateside. Yep. And as we all know, vetting and evaluating these mines is very, very important. And so I, um, I think if, if I were, um, if I were good at the raising money part, I would find someone and really prioritize buying the right things Um, because not all Bitcoin matters are made the same. There's so many, there's so many things which are um, a lot of the floors are going to drop out uh, under a lot of these miners um, who thought they were pretty solid this summer and this fall. So we'll see. Um, uh, Yeah. I don't really, I don't really have a lot of insight. A lot of the, a lot of the questions you ask will, I'm like, oh shoot, that's a good question. I should probably figure that out. And then a few months later, I kind of have my head wrapped around it, and I like <laughs> want to come back and say, okay, here's my view on this. Well, we're, we're having you on more frequently, so we'll, yeah. we'll give you the opportunity to do that. Um, I'm just spitballing questions because yeah. I'm really curious about it. We have some great writers for Mining Memoir newsletter, and Anthony Power. Shout out to him. Um, yeah, he did a nice write up on Celsius, and that got me thinking about what MA activity looks like going forward. Um, I also have a great opportunity to talk to a lot of different miners in the space. Pivoting conversations, though, I want to talk about heat. I want to talk about July mining weather. Uh, just for Compass customers who are out there or other miners out there who are like looking at the temperature gauge and they're like, damn, my S19 is off again. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not surprising in a lot of ways. Coming from my home mining experience where going to get my ASIC online even during like 65 degree weather. Certainly it's not going to last when the ambient temperature is 95 degrees and you have a chip that can't really survive that. Um, curious to get your take on, on the heat wave and then also just looking in Oklahoma, Texas area, what it's like down there, uh, what you guys are doing to, to keep your ASICs online and running. Do you guys have any offline right now? What's your expectations for, for downtime? Um, yeah, there's, there's tons of questions around this. To me, this is like, this is an engineering question at its heart. It's an engineering question for both the ASIC chip, the machine, and then whatever facility you're using a hut, home mine, larger retrofitted facility. Yeah. This is where, um, if you're containerized or if you've got a facility, this is where your, all your attention to airflow really matters. Um, and this is where that kind of corner of the the container that you, that's kind of a little off to the side of the of the fan is gonna 
is going to really screw a lot of your airflow up. And if you don't have sealed backplating, and this is where like a lot of the actual design and engineering that went into building your Bitcoin mine comes to play, especially as you, if you're south of um, Oklahoma. Um, I've seen, yeah, we have pretty significant efficiency loss for machines. Um, they managed to stay online. And again, my heart's, I, I get a little anxious uh, during the heat of the day. We'll turn down some operations just because it's not worth it to us to, um, to try to run them at these significantly high chips temperatures. But again, a lot of these ASICs, they're designed to, to run um, pretty well. And especially if you have plenty of airflow. Um, I think it's kind of interesting because we saw the previous era of Bitcoin mining be quite seasonal. We saw the, the, during the Chinese wet season, uh, you, you saw that create this really interesting market dynamic with a shift in hash rate on and off, and you could bet on that. We're going to start seeing uh, heat play a pretty significant role as a lot of this hash rate centralizes around Texas and the lower, the lower 48 states. So it's going to be kind of interesting. I wonder if we'll have our own equivalent of like um, for a few years of significant efficiency or kind of hash rate drawdown just um, because it's way too dang hot in Texas. And we've certainly seen that. I mean, it went the past week we've seen uh, hash rate go down. A lot of that we can pretty clearly tie to Texas miners. Technically, um, we'll have to see. I think one summer for uh, one of these new ASICs isn't enough time to really see how it affects it because what happens it's it's really the cooling off and on of the chips that that really destroys all this computer hardware yeah it can get way too hot and you can you can short stuff out um or you can burn plugs and transistors and stuff but i mean what happens if you you're you know your watts minor m30s which is powered through this summer right and it's done pretty well um what happens if you do that five years in a row so are you now looking at significant significantly more uh, mean time to failure or significantly lower mean time to failure for that machine. I think we'll see that. We just won't know. If I were somebody, um, if I were a less altruistic miner, I'd probably try to replace the hardware that I ran too hot this summer, even if it made it out the other end alive. Interesting. Uh, that's a uh, perspective I haven't heard yet. So from my knowledge of the matter comes from trying to get my home mine up and running um, and then mining with compass. And luckily my miner last summer was up in Quebec. So it was like pretty okay. It can get very hot in like the lower half of Canada. Uh, you can get some really warm temperatures up there. Um, yeah. But my miner in Quebec ran without any problems last summer, but in Texas, not only are we seeing curtailing, which is going to take your miner offline, obviously, cause you have no energy, but we're also seeing, degrees of 105 plus like that's really hot it's hard to run a bitcoin mine there yeah you know, i will say yeah when the ambient temperature is over 95 98 it's just too hot to run most miners um if you're able to have enough just powered airflow through them you can you might be able to keep them on with with efficiency drawdowns but if you're running these giant mines of several megawatts and your ambient heat is coming through and you don't have perfect air circulation I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel too confident about that. I, I'm not surprised by miners going off. A lot of it is. Um, we're really going to see a lot of just the the idiosyncrasies between various S19 models are really going to show themselves. The different kind of control boards, who you know glued the 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 heat sinks onto the chips. Like that's actually going to matter probably this summer. Yeah, so I had RK Mission Critical, which makes a lot of the hash. It's actually based out here in Denver. When you when you come up, maybe we can go on a uh, facility tour together. But oh, probably, yeah, yeah, they're cool guys. We had them on the pod yesterday. I don't know when we're going to publish it, but. Uh, we're just talking about like the engineering behind their hash huts or their hash containers. I think hash huts is technically trademarked by somebody, but uh, it's like the Kleenex yeah. of uh, containerized mining. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, can I just use the word, please, uh, or the phrase? Yeah. It, anyways, like the engineering behind their designs was super impressive. 
but even them, they, they acknowledge that there's problems still. And they have one of the most robust systems I've seen. Like they have redundancies. They can jam two megawatts of power within that thing. They only use uh, the top of the line regulated equipment. They basically only use anything that's manufactured in the United States. I think they have one part that comes from China and it's just power plugs, like the top stuff. And even their containers during the summer sometimes go down because there's not enough airflow. And so they're actually working on a Texas version of their containers to increase airflow. Uh, so to me, it's just like, this is the bleeding edge, right? Where we have removed a, an energy problem with China using too much coal during one part of the year, which a lot of people were not uh, friendly with and then having to unpack everything and move it south for a, a period. We moved it to the United States. Now we have a heat problem. It's very warm here in the United States. Like a lot of the United States has the same uh, longitudinal or latitudinal um, area as the Sahara in, in the Africa, right? So it's like, yeah. it's not that different if you're talking about like where the sun is hitting the United States. Um, so I think a lot of Bitcoin miners who are jumping into it also have different expectations and they're going to have to learn pretty quickly, uh, myself included, right? When I was getting my miner up and up and running, it was like, well, this is a bummer. It's not running. I'm losing money. But it's how yeah. it is. Yeah, man, it's hot. It's going to wreak havoc. We'll see. The next week in Oklahoma and Texas is going to be over 100. And so that'll be a really interesting case study to see, well, if 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 ERCOT's not going to hit peak demand, well, then still what kind of hash rate which we can attribute to Texas miners goes down or declines. Yeah. That'll be an interesting case study. Yeah. While you mentioned ERCOT, maybe we can uh, wrap up the conversation there. Yesterday, was it yesterday? Two days ago, we saw that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was hitting like a peak demand for energy. Uh, when we talk about energy markets, we have the head and the shoulders, right? So during the summer, everyone's turning on their AC units. During the fall, it's a little bit cooler temperatures. People aren't using as much energy. So see the heads are sort of being... Uh, summer and winter. And right now everyone is turning on their AC unit when they're home, pulling so much energy from the grid. Bitcoin miners turned off yesterday in response to ERCOT calling for them to do so. It turned off on a dot and just saw a lot of hash rate go off the network, which is pretty cool that Bitcoiners are able to do that. At the same time, we're seeing some people being like, this was sort of close. There was so much energy demand and almost not enough energy, even with these Bitcoin miners going offline. Uh, and, and we also know that ERC has been pumping the brakes on applications for plugging in Bitcoin miners to their grid. So be curious to get your take on it. Do you see ERCOT continuing to say no to Bitcoin miners moving south? Uh, or do you? Th- I personally think Bitcoin miners stop moving to Texas as much as they have been in the past just because they're, they're just... Oh, there's a lot of energy, but there's also a lot of demand for that energy. And it's hard to see where those two things even out. What's interesting and a relief to me is that ERCOT didn't actually, you know, totally have rolling blackouts the other day. That was really nice. Energy pricing did spike pretty crazy. And it's a nice, you know, this is like the third or fourth time this story has been ran, which is ERCOT miners turn off, save the grid. And I love to pump it. I will say a lot of these guys very cleverly are getting paid a ton of money to go off. I don't know which ones, um, but like that's that wor- it works great both ways. It's a great news story. Um, I don't want to be the miner who uh, who has who has to turn off uh, and doesn't get paid. Um, and then ERCOT doesn't cover all of Texas. There's there are pockets across these grids where uh, there is opportunity. And um, I'm seeing, I've talked to a lot of people building just outside of ERCOT where you kind of get the sec, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese, right? So um, they're able to go in, The maybe the utility is, is somewhat more familiar with this. They have their heads wrapped around it. I still think broadly, kind of every utility has absolutely no clue what they're doing and and is blown away when a miner says, yeah, we just go off and on 20 megawatts. Sure. Um, often in, in five minutes to these utilities, like 20 megawatts is like, a, you know, a giant smelting plant or, I, you know, whatever kind of other industrial process. That's like their biggest client. And to, you know, people who are mid size, that's kind of a standard deal. And um, so it just blows a lot of these people away. And like I was talking to another fellow miner here in Tulsa who was talking about a deal where, 
um, they realized that it was having a lot of trouble because um, these utilities just didn't know that, well, yeah, they're in containers, but we don't really want to just pick up and walk away. Like we want to be your client for a long time. So um, yeah. we'll see the regulators the the next year or two is going to be huge for who wants to understand Bitcoin mining and invite us to your region. <laughs> um, we'll see. ERCOT, I, it helps a lot to have like uh, one of the more prominent senators like Ted Cruz really advocate for it. And we're seeing yeah. some other we're seeing some other people do it now. They don't necessarily get to tell um, the ERCOT or the utility what to do, but if they're championing it, then um, that goes a long way. Again, a year and a half ago, this none of these conversation topics were even considered to be part of the narrative. Yeah. Now I'm curious to see what happens. I'm curious to see what other states pick up more Bitcoin mining activity. Of course, we have like the foundry snapshots of the US states. The snapshots are okay. Like I think they give you a good estimate of who's like in the top 10. Um, Georgia yeah. came in last time with like 30% of the network's hash rate, which I know of a few large mines there. 30% still seems a little high. I feel like New York is probably still the highest. Um, but I'd be curious to get your take. Uh, from here on out, I mean, I'd love to see more Colorado mining, but I feel like energy prices are a little too expensive up here to get that done. I'm ha- I was happy to see the coin metrics report you had Patrick on the other day uh, or Oklahoma top 10. Um, I think it's only going to go up. Uh, w- yeah, we'll see. Um, I hope that Colorado can be optimistic. I don't know if on the oil and gas side, for those of us mining on yeah. at the well site, there was a little bit of a story the other day about um, uh, mining off natural gas regulators, decision makers didn't really know what it was, didn't really approve of it. Um, likely going to result in some kind of soft moratorium on that, which is yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, you see, you know, I come from the world of oil and gas. We saw um, Colorado based really effectively to try to ban all oil and gas by some kind of obscure, very broad, um, you know, definition on, uh, zoning and distance from certain things. And um, that is very, that's a huge region for oil and gas. And I think that mindset you apply to different states and we'll see. Um, I think a lot of this is very random. Like a lot of these people don't know the impact their decisions are making. And some of these decisions will be bad when they think they're good. And some of them will just be kind of neutral when they have, when they think they're bad or good. And so I yeah. um, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. Nebraska seems to be pretty interesting. That's where a lot of compute norths um, hash rate is. Some of the northern yeah. states um, yeah. are also kind of interesting. I know there's decent in Minnesota and some North Dakota. North Dakota yeah. seems to be embracing the flare gas narrative pretty well. Um, that's the Bakken. That's ton of that's ton of shale and shale is very distressed right now. And that's also where a lot of the, on the oil producer side, that's where a lot of uh, kind of innovation happens. Lots of deep, long laterals being drilled, mm-hmm. having been drilled out there. And I think maybe that'll happen on the Bitcoin side. Yeah, just a riff on it before we close. Um, and then we'll get a hash rate prediction update from you uh, as, as one is needed. I do think that energy is going to become much more important for anyone who's a Bitcoin miner. I like a really good take, Will. But it's yeah. true, right? Right now we're going to bear market. If you look at S19 cost of production for one Bitcoin, or if you look at the margin for earning, like it's just collapsing. Like July is rough. June to July is a huge collapse. Look at December to July, just significant, very significant. We talked about that with the Coinmetrics podcast um, earlier this week as well. Energy is only going to become more important. And that's during a bear market is where you're able to experiment. You're able to find different energy solutions and you're able to innovate based on what your current resources are. So I think there's some really cool uh, energy sources out there that we haven't explored yet. Hopefully we can get more of those people on the podcast. We had one back in the spring on like uh, this weird ocean thermal technology that you're able to mine Bitcoin with. Uh, we've had nuclear guys on. I'm sure we'll have more energy people in the future talking about it because it's it's only going to become more important as the cost of production of mining and Bitcoin increases um, and the cost of Bitcoin decreases. Yeah, what's the break-even power rate for S19s right now? It's the low teens or something? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, even if a lot of people are predicting, oh, Bitcoin down to 14,000, if it hits that, then everybody starts breaking even, um, if not already, in real terms. I think a lot of the narrative is going to be what you said, energy, but then energy reliability. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you're online. You don't care if you're online at seven cents or four cents or two cents. You just care that you're online. And yeah. that's where a lot of these contracts are going to be the dust shaking off and they're going to open them and they'll be like, ah, well, legally we have to, you have to mm-hmm. keep this online. And that's where a lot of the prudent legal side of a lot of the energy procurement is going to be scrutinized. Yeah. Um, so it's a bull market for lawyers and <laughs> um, in every aspect of Bitcoin and crypto. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Fred Thiel and uh, Marathon would agree with you. Getting online is somewhat more important. Um, Downtime can be a killer. So it's sort of the third leg to the stool of OPEX and CAPEX is downtime um, for subtime. Let's get a hash rate prediction from you as we close up, though. What do you think by end of year? I forget what you said last time. Yeah, oh, man. 300 camp. You sound like you were a 300 camp guy. Oh, I was. And I want to try to be the bull. Um, I don't think I can be. Every every single thing looks so. Is every, I don't know of it. I don't know if anybody executing on their timeline as well as they would hope. Um, so I I floated, uh, you know, months ago. Maybe we could see three fifty. Definitely not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I kind of settled on. Well, I think we'll probably see three hundred. I'm going to revise lower. I two fifty seems kind of optimistic. Um. So maybe I've overcorrected and uh, the end of the year is bullish. Again, we said, I think we did uh, agree that like, okay, if Bitcoin price skyrockets, a lot of the problems just disappear. Mm -hmm. Um, But even if it goes up, there's still lead times. It's going to be hard to get hash rate online. 250 is my middle of the pack prediction now. 250, 250. Okay. Heard it here first. I mean, it's pretty fair. If if Marathon can get some of these miners online, things are looking pretty good for them with Compute North going yeah. to the fall. Then that's a lot of hash rate. Maybe some of these Celsius units end up on different racks. They can get online quickly. We'll yeah, see. we'll see what happens. just just some some kind of context historically. Um, it's kind of interesting to to view uh, history and the history of hash rate because in 2017 the market peaked in December, and then hash rate increased fourfold the next year and then had a 60% drawdown, probably coinciding with the price of Bitcoin uh, st- stabilizing at six and then plummeting to three. We've seen hash rate respond much more immediately and much more responsively to a drawdown in the market. I think that's yeah. kind of by chance and driven by more infrastructure issues. Um, and I just think uh, that we won't see it respond as reflexively to the upside due to the scale challenges that are now required to build these. Interesting. Interesting take. 250, though, is what I'm writing down. 250, baby. 250 you know, exit hash. We'll later this year, Charlie, and we'll uh, you'll pay up if you're wrong. I actually should have made a bet with everybody when I did this. I could have made possibly a lot of money. Yeah, let's possibly. We'll make a bet on like some ETH poly market platform or something. <laughs> just everyone actually, off. that would be a really good idea. <laughs> I should do that. Yeah, then I'll make these Bitcoiners use a Ethereum market, and then they'll not realize it and get pissed. So yeah, that's a, you can bet on it on chain, but but it'll be proof of stake by then too. So uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> bet on a proof of stake chain. Cool. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Um, see you here pretty soon in Denver for a in person recording. Yeah, rock on. Cool.